Okay, well, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I did want to point out, and in addition to this, lovely things that Carol had to say about it. Um, it seemed relevant to what I'm talking about today. Uh, I actually am a veteran as well, serving the United States Air Force um, in uh, Texas at Lackland as a combat arms instructor, where I want people out from M16 and I and M16 machine guns, so um, there are any veterans there, I'd be happy to talk weapons with you after the, uh, after the talk. Um, what I want to talk about today is not the war itself, but the way we think about the war and the way we remember the war. Um, but I want to show you the trailer to a film that's going to get me, get us into the discussion that I want to have. Vietnam, 1984. Chuck Norris is James Brad, decorated war hero, ex prisoner of war, an American on a mission. One man who couldn't forget the Americans that were left behind. We categorically deny that there are any living MIA in Vietnam. Wrong answer. James Braddock has returned. To uncover the truth and free the soldiers. We're going home. Missing in action. Damn right. James Braddock yeah! declares war. The war isn't over until the last man comes home. America had no more heroes. Until now, Chuck Norris, missing in action. So by the middle of the 1980s, we had arrived at what we thought was the working narrative about the war. Um, we had spent almost a decade soul searching um, and struggling to make sense of what had happened in uh, Vietnam between the landing of the Marines at Da Nang in 1965 and that final evacuation from the roof of the embassy in Saigon in 1975. So we arrived at a narrative, a version of events that we spoke about in public that it recognized its heroes, uh, it identified the enemies, very importantly, uh, and it located the war within its proper place within the nation's history. Or so we thought. This 1984 version, which you saw part of for this trailer for Missing in Action, was a far cry from the one that we had in 1973. Um, I had a very nice clip. Uh, from a documentary called Hearts and Minds. It was a decidedly anti-war documentary. I don't know, can't play the clip, unfortunately. Um, it had some very, very famous scenes in which General Westmoreland, the leader of American troops in Vietnam, in the first years of the war basically said that for the Vietnamese, life is cheap. And that death means nothing. And I also had a clip of a former pilot agonizing over the destruction that he had caused the Vietnamese. Um, and this was very much what we were struggling with in the early 1970s at the war's end. But by the time Chuck Norris here is rescued the POW a decade later, this script had effectively been flipped. Sure, there are some Americans that are to blame for the war, but it's not the people who fought it. Uh, and while in 73 the Vietnamese had largely been seen as victims for many Americans, okay, um, victims of America's ill-conceived and poorly executed attempt at nation building, by the 80s they were unquestionably the real enemy of the war. But despite the best efforts of James Braddock, uh, this version from the mid-1980s does not become the permanent version. It is only temporary. And by the turn of the millennium, we have a new interpretation of the war. Okay? One in which there are plenty of heroes. And interestingly, there are heroes on both sides of the conflict. So let me show you a film. Simple orders, Hal. Find the enemy and kill him. You have no idea 
care of your men. Teach them to take care of each other. Each other is all we're gonna have. So we have a decidedly different view here of what's happening in Vietnam in 2002. Two years ago, Ken Burns released an 18-hour documentary on Vietnam. Some of you may have seen it. Um, and in an interview leading up to the release of that film, Ken Burns uh, was quoted as saying, Vietnam is a war we have consciously ignored. He couldn't be more wrong. <coughs> in the years since the end of the war, we have had this ongoing debate about what the war meant, what lessons we should learn from it, and how we should commemorate it. Uh, so tonight what I want to explore is this debate in a little bit of detail. And I want to approach it not so much from a historical viewpoint, but from a viewpoint of memory. Okay? Um, in other words, how did the nation's public memory of Vietnam change from hearts and minds, this very anti-war, very guilt-ridden film from 1974, to we were soldiers? with a view of American soldiers as decidedly the heroes of the conflict. What stories do we want to tell, how do we want to tell them, and how do these stories change, essentially, what I wanted to add. Um, so, and if you'll permit me for just a few minutes, this is where I turn into like the geeky history professor and talk like a little bit of theory. Not much, I promise. We're not gonna get too deep when we get into this, okay? Um, but at the start, of, uh, at the end of the war, in the early 1970s, um, the nation had been traumatized, effectively, by the conflict. Um, there were many unfavorable stories that were emerging from the war. Uh, there was troop rebellions taking place in Vietnam. There are veterans who are returning their medals in protest at home. There's issues of drug addiction. There's issues of mental health. There's public acknowledgement of the brutal and sometimes criminal treatment of the Vietnamese by U.S. troops. We're also processing the fact that over the course of several decades, nation leaders had lied to us about what was happening in Vietnam. So to say the least, we've been pushed back on our heels. The story of the war didn't match the realities of our past wars, um, and it didn't match our understanding of our role as a nation, as a global leader. So, in 1973, what we were largely trying to come to terms with was what we had done to Vietnam. But by 2002, by the time we get to the were Soldiers, what we had settled on was a version that focused on what Vietnam had done to us. And that's the story I'm going to explore here. Okay. So, to understand this transition, we do need to know a little bit about um, memory. Uh, lots of historians have written lots of books about the history of the war, so we're not going to focus on that. Um, historians recently, and by our, I mean recently over the past couple decades, we deal with long stretches of time, so recently for us, 30 years, um, have been exploring this idea of how we as a culture and society use and remember the past. Okay? Uh, so there's two starting points to deal with this. Uh, the first is that it's memories about ideas and beliefs. It's about what we want to believe, how we want to view ourselves. It's not necessarily about facts. In other words, creation of memory is not about achieving factual accuracy, um, but about making events fit a narrative that we are creating about who we are. The second thing to understand about public memory is that it's a tool. It's something we use to help us make decisions in the present. If uh, we think back to how we approached foreign policy in the decade or so after the Vietnam War, we referenced Vietnam a great deal. We cannot let this turn into the next Vietnam. So we use this memory of the war, um, or any war, to help us understand the past in the way that we can use it and make decisions in the present. In a way, this is kind of just like how we 
our own personal memory works. The things happen to us. We remember some parts of it. We don't remember other parts of what happened to us. And then we filter all that into something that helps us make sense of who we are and how that allows us to move forward when faced with future challenges. Public memory exists or uh, acts in a very similar way. So the facts in memory are selective at best. So how do we create? Well, there's a couple different ways. Um, it is constructed. It just doesn't happen organically. There's a process involved where people, society makes choices about what we're going to remember and what we aren't going to remember. So there's a constructed nature to it. And as I mentioned, it's also about meeting present needs. We're not trying to understand the past as the past. We're trying to understand what happened in a way that informs what we do moving forward. It's also constructed constructed largely by society's elites, by which I mean a combination of politicians and culture makers. Okay. Uh, if you have time at the end, I have some stuff up here that contributes to this. Um, my favorite is there's a comic book series from the 1980s called The Nam. Um, it ran for almost a decade. Um, and it seems like this that helped shape our memory of the war. Um, Writers, filmmakers, politicians, these are all the people who in various ways helped build these narratives about the Vietnam War. And then finally, this is linked to our sense of identity. Who are we? What do we value as a society? And how can we take these things that happen to us and either use them to change what we value or, more often, work into an understanding of our already existing values. So, four components about Vietnam work into our shaping of the war's matter. Um, first is politics. How we changed our understanding and our discussion of the politics of the war. The second is memorials. This is a part that you may be very familiar with. Uh, the third is our discussion of veterans. How do we understand what happened to the people who fought the war? And then finally, how do we understand the Vietnamese? What role are they going to play in this narrative and this memory of the war we create? So let's start with politics. Vietnam is intricately linked with the Cold War. But the Cold War changed significantly between 1965 in the early 1970s. Uh, when the war began in 65, we were just a few years removed from the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, the Americans saw President Johnson's decision to send troops in in March 65 as an important fight, or a important part of our fight against communism. And we certainly did not think, we certainly did not think that this would end the way that it did. But by the first years of the 70s, mere five years later, much of this had changed. Okay? Americans saw the war now, most Americans saw the war as unwinnable, and communism seemed far less of a threat than it had five years ago. President Nixon, just a few years into the decade, is going to go to China to meet with the communist government in China, and he's going to sign uh, arms deals or an arms treaty with the Soviet Union. So we went from aggressively fighting communism in the mid-1960s to finding a way of hopefully, peacefully, coexisting with it. So the Cold War climate's changed pretty dramatically, which is when he creates some new challenges for Richard Nixon when he takes over the presidency in 1969. So in shaping his policy, okay, he lays the groundwork in two important ways for the memory of the war that's going to emerge through the 70s and even more so in the 1980s. The first thing he's going to do is shift the blame away from the decisions that started the war and towards the people who opposed the way he wanted to end the war. In a speech uh, in 1969, he very famous said this was his great, very famous silent majority speech. What he basically said was that the quote he would put up on the flyer that the Vietnamese cannot defeat the United States. 
only Americans can defeat the United States. So there's this process taking place, this thinking taking place, which is going to shift what happens, what's coming down the road, off of the Vietnamese, off of America's politicians who started the war, got us into the war, and towards the people who, in the early 1970s, were not fully supportive of what Richard Nixon was doing. These people were undermining the nation's war effort. In shifting the blame, uh, one of the things he did, um, and I, I will take questions about this at the end, because um, this is probably one of the more controversial parts of what I'm going to talk about, is he, we began creating an image of the anti-war movement. The anti-war movement was a really complicated movement. It had a lot of different parts. People approached it from a lot of different perspectives. But for most people today, I think what we see or think about is this. The first thing, this is a veteran, the first thing that happened when I got off the plane in San Francisco, a girl in love beads and a headband spat in my face and called me a baby killer. This is a very simplified version of the anti-war movement. And we could actually, I could spend an entire lecture just discussing what's going on in this very simple frame. Um, but the larger point here is, is that we are taking what was very complex and boiling it down to something very simple. Okay. We're taking hippies and anti-war activists and putting them together. Okay. We're uh, seeing disrespect and aggression when in many cases there was not. In many cases, the anti-war movement was very respectful of veterans. In many cases, the anti-war movement was made up of veterans. But we begin shifting our popular understanding of it down to these more simplified images. The other thing we did in shifting our focus more towards what's happening at home is that he starts developing the stabbed in the back idea. The stabbed in the back idea. The notion that the war was winnable. And that the reason we didn't win was because our troops were stabbed in the back. That the possibility was there if the right decisions were made by the right people. But ultimately, that did not happen. And in focusing on these ideas, it made it a lot easier to kind of move away from how the war began. We began not talking about why we were in Vietnam. What we began talking about was what happened when we left Vietnam. And many presidents after this and opinion, uh, public opinion makers are going to pick up on this idea. Um, in 80, 1980, Ronald Reagan makes a speech um, to a group of military veterans calling the war noble. And more importantly, that it, quote, should have been won. Um, once he was president, he stated that the troops came home without a victory, quote, not because they'd been defeated, but because they'd been, not been denied permission to win. And this is something that actually just continued in the new Ken Burns documentary about the war. Um, the narrator states in several different ways uh, several different points, that this is a war that was, quote, started in good faith by decent men. So we're refocusing our attention on the people that, at home who kept us from winning the war. That becomes the political story of Vietnam by the end of the 1970s. The other thing that Nixon does is to place POWs front and center in the story of the war. Uh, first, right after he comes to office, he uses it as a way of trying to sustain support for the war. The war effort, the goals, the initial goals of the war had largely fallen away. Many people did not believe them anymore. But Nixon used bringing the troops home, bringing the POWs home, as a way of <coughs> trying to convince Americans that that's why we need to stay there. We need to stay there until we can make sure that all of our POWs come home. 
And then later, he makes this a central part of ending the war. We're not going to take any deal that does not include making absolutely sure that every POW comes home. And he would often use this as a diversion away from the tactics that were taking place in Paris during the negotiations to end the war. He would often say that POWs are the thing that's hanging us up here. So POWs become the center in a very important way of our discussions about how we end the war. So in 1969, he launches this uh, campaign called Go Public. And we're going to go public about POWs. Okay. And uh, uh, throughout the summer of 69, administration officials, with the hope of help of POW families and billionaire H. Ross Perot, he always pops up at really interesting times <laughs> over the past 40 years. He all of a sudden, like, there's Perot all of a sudden. Uh, he shows up, yeah, he's really interesting. Um, so basically, they embark on this campaign, and what they begin doing is to create a language about the Vietnamese uh, that paints as a, them as incredibly human, which is not to say um, that that wasn't true, that the conduct of uh, the NLF, the Vietnam, and the North Vietnamese was not brutal. But the factual reality of the war is that there was brutality on all sides, and that's what gets pushed aside. The New York Times helps in the Go Public campaign, and it helps shape this image of the Vietnamese as cruel and unhuman. The big organization that helps in this regard, that picks up the POW issue and really runs with it, is the National League of Families of American Prisoners and Missing in Southeast Asia. And they're going to act as the primary non-governmental activist agency that worked with the White House to further these issues. And it proved highly successful. Okay. Uh, the placing POWs at the center of our Vietnam debate in regards to how we're going to end the war proved very popular. And in this process, in this ongoing issue, uh, two symbols emerge as very powerful to bring this up. The first are POW bracelets. Um, they're created by a Los Angeles group called VIVA, V-I-V-A, which stood for Victory in Vietnam in May 1970. Um, what they did, they had a name. They contained the name of an American POW and the date that he was captured. The one you can see there is um, James Stockton, who's a Navy pilot. Uh, and his wife, Sybil, was the one who helped found national families. Okay. At the height of their popularity, over four million of these were being worn by Americans, including Ronald Reagan, Sonny and Cher. Sonny and Cher, Woo! the young people are like, I have no idea. <laughs> um, and Princess Grace of Monaco, they were very popular. Um, Viva's a uh, pro-worker, and they're popular amongst conservative Americans. Um, but the success of this campaign raises millions, millions for Viva. And what they do is turn around and take that money and invest it into a series of events meant to keep the spotlight on the POW MIA issue. The other symbol, as you can see here, is the POW MIA flag. This is created in 1972 for the National League of Families. It becomes their official flag. Um, it doesn't gain a lot of popularity to the 1980s, but this is something that is created in the early 70s as part of this largest campaign to center our attention on what's happening to POWs in Vietnam. What this does is to lead us into an interesting discussion. Reagan's election in the 1980s changed the direction of the POW MIA campaign. But that direction was built upon what had happened in the 1970s by drawing people's attention to POWs. Um, during the Carter years, the National Family, the National uh, League of Families actually kind of been marginalized and fallen out with the government. They were actually fairly contentious. They had a contentious relationship with the Carter administration. But with Reagan, he reinvigorates the POW MIA campaign um, as part of his larger reinvigorated fight against communism uh, and reviving our sense of pride and patriotism that had in large part been damaged 
by the war. So he embraces the National League of Families, and he is intent on punishing those who had been responsible for the defeat in Vietnam. And in part, in large part, he sees the Vietnamese as responsible for that. So he begins pushing the idea, not just Reagan, but a, a growing number of people began pushing the idea that soldiers who had not been accounted for, soldiers who were listed as still MIA, could possibly still be alive and held in captivity by the Vietnamese. The, the argument for this is kind of convoluted, but in essence, it becomes very popular. There were American troops who were still being held by the Vietnamese in the Vietnam War in Laos. In 81, Reagan actually authorized the use of mercenaries to go look for them. In 82, a retired Green Beret and a Vietnam veteran named Bo Brits led a group into Laos. And then, uh, both these missions failed to locate every, anybody. Bogris, by the way, actually becomes involved in uh, the negotiations during the Ruby Ridge uh, standoff. He is very popular, was very popular within um, kind of survivalist segment of the American population. Very well known. Um, I have actually a book up here, you can look at it, written about his, his attempt to recover troops in Laos. This becomes public knowledge particularly Bogris, he was very, he was a great self-promoter. Um, and when it became known that this was going on, Hollywood latched onto it, and we see the release of more than a few films, some of questionable quality, <laughs> um, that deal with this issue. And I think something that is really interesting is if you, when you put these next to each other, the messages become very clear. The importance of the single individual as the hero. You have a single guy there with a gun, uh, usually very muscular in the case of Rambo there. I, I, I have that poster in my office. It's very <laughs> um, and there's quotes like, you know, the war is not over until every man comes home. Um, this time, they get to win. So there's certainly a political message. Okay? Our thinking is being led in particular directions by these films. Okay? And this is, as I'll talk here a little bit, kind of the tip of the iceberg of films about Vietnam that start to emerge in the late 70s and early 1980s. But as, again, as you see the imagery, the messaging is all pretty similar. Okay? So there's something happening. We have an idea, and we're expressing it at multiple places, but in very similar terms. So what this also allows us to do is to focus on the truth, the men who fought the war. Again, we don't want to discuss the politics of it. We don't want to focus on why we went there and what we did. What we want to focus on is how we can get past this. And the way we decided to do that was to focus on the people who had served in Vietnam and what the war had done to them. So, the issue over POWs becomes one way of discussing this. The idea that there could still possibly be uh, troops alive in Southeast Asia becomes another way of discussing it. Uh, the third way that we do it, the one I think that is most significant and most prominent, is the way we chose to memorialize those who died. I don't think it would be hard to argue that this, the wall, the Vietnam Veterans Wall, has become possibly the most effective, important memorial we have in DC. Um, if memorials exist, and, and they do, uh, they exist to make, help us make connections with what happened, to find a way of making sense of it, or, or emotionally processing it, of moving past it, then I don't think there's a more effective memorial than the Vietnam Veterans Wall in Washington, DC. It was not always so well thought of, though. Um, in fact, in the years after the war, many people didn't want to have a memorial 
at all. And this came from all sides. Okay? Um, the people who opposed the war did not want to see a memorial to something that they considered immoral. Uh, the people, uh, more hawkish people, did not want to see a war, a memorial to a war that we did not win. So there's various critiques of the idea of memorializing what happened in Vietnam. Okay. And which, and that all seems like it's not until the late 70s that we really get around to discussing this. Um, but in shifting our attention away from the politics and towards the soldiers, we are able to enter this discussion. How do we memorialize the soldiers? How can we memorialize the people who fought the war and made the ultimate sacrifice in a way that doesn't draw attention to the politics of it? And in the name itself, we see that issue being discussed. The Vietnam veterans Memorial, not the Vietnam War. Okay. So in 1980, uh, President Carter, right before he leaves office, uh, signs a uh, bill to create a national memorial for the Vietnam War in D.C. There's an organization called the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, the VVMF, uh, led by a veteran man named Jan Scruggs. And they announced a design competition. We're going to solicit designs for this memorial. Over 1,400 were sent. Over 1,400 were sent in. They announced the winning design on May 1st, 1981, and the design was the product of a 19-year-old Yale architecture student called Maya Lin, that you see here. Maya Lin with Jan Strokes when they announced her design. Initially, there wasn't a lot of controversy. Initially, the design was fairly well received. But slowly over time, criticism does begin to emerge. Um, primarily, it's coming from uh, conservatives who wanted a memorial that showed greater support for the war aims, for the politics of it. Um, and they wanted something that unambiguously portrayed those who died as heroes. Uh, Charles Krauthammer, uh, recently passed away, called Lynn's design a quote, disservice to history. And a member of the organization that led this, uh, Tom Carhart, called it, this quote up here, a black gash of shame and sorrow. And once opposition to this begins to emerge, it steamrolls. Uh, there's pushback coming from veterans. There's pushback coming from members of Congress. And largely this pushback is about trying to find a way of honoring soldiers more uh, obviously, uh, more forcefully, and really having a world that talks about service and sacrifice and patriotism. So there's a great deal of debate about this. How are we going to resolve this debate? And ultimately, what the organization does, the VVMF, what they agree to do is to add a flagpole with the U.S. flag on it and a more traditional statue of three soldiers. Uh, and this was included in the final design before uh, groundbreaking her. The groundbreaking her. You can see the three soldiers statue there on the top. The response to the wall was unexpected. The emotional outpouring that occurred uh, when people started visiting was not anticipated. I don't think anyone anticipated how people would connect with this memorial having been so different from everything we've done before. And really, it's a list of names. And I don't think anyone really thought that this would be something that would have an effect, but it did. How can a list of names do this? Um, but it did. Um, and in 1993, we start to see additions because of the popularity of it. Groups who were not initially included in the memorial lobby to be included in the area where the wall is. They do not make it onto the wall. Um, but we do see a uh, traditional statue that's dedicated to the women who served in the war, mostly nurses. Um, it's something we've really come to understand over the past decades is the sacrifice and the involvement of women in the military in Vietnam. 
And then finally, in 2004, we get this, a plaque that was placed at the memorial site to those who had served in Vietnam and later died as a result of their injuries. This was, if I remember correctly, a compromise of sorts as a resolution to the uh, issue surrounding Agent Orange, another chemical exfoliates that led to what some people believe is cancer and, and um, uh, fatal diseases that in fact that died many years after the war ended. The war, the wall is so central um, to our memory that we have traveling versions of it. Several traveling versions of it. I did not realize that there were more than one. I knew there was one. There's a group out of Brevard, Florida that has a wall. Um, the original organization, the VVMF, has their own wall. Um, what they have called the wall that heals. Uh, and there's also a version called the moving wall that also travels around the nation. So for those who cannot make it to D.C., there are opportunities to have their own experience with this memorial. So the process from the end of the war in 73 through the mid-80s, particularly once we get the wall up and we see the response to it, is to focus on healing. Our discussion about what we needed to do as a nation was heal. We needed to help those who fought the war heal. We needed as a nation to heal. We needed to bind our wounds. We needed to move forward. After all, I just mentioned, the wall, one of the nicknames of the wall, heals. And it becomes a physical focal point for this process. And a good deal of our efforts to heal focused on servicemen. And this is important to focus on that in the 80s because in the 1970s, we had a much different view of people who returned from the war. Not all of us. But there was a very popular image in the 1970s that Vietnam veterans were dangerous. They were drug addicts. They had mental health problems reporting on events such as what happened in My Lai encouraged a belief in this. But at best, we're confused about how to look at our veterans in the early 70s, and at best, or worse, we're scared. We begin talking about something that's initially known as Vietnam Syndrome, which would later be recognized and renamed as PTSD. That comes out of our discussion of what is happening to the men and women who return from now, so in the 70s, there was an image out there of the drug addict, the antisocial, the criminal, and or the psychotic veteran that appears all over popular culture. There is a subgenre of B-movies, drive-in movies that focus on motorcycle gangs, very popular in the late 70s and early 80s. Many of the lesser known films focus on outlaw biker gangs that were composed of Vietnam veterans who were engaging in overtly criminal acts. TV shows, again, the young people in the crowd will not understand what I'm about to say. Kojak, um, Hawaii Five, well, they remade Hawaii Five, but much different show back then. Um, on shows, these crime procedural shows, these police procedural shows, you would often see Vietnam vets, but they would be the criminals that the police were chasing. And of course, on film, the two most well known vets that we were scared of in the early 1970s was Travis Bickle from Taxi Driver, psychotic killer of Taxi Driver, and Nick from The Deer Hunt, who was so traumatized by the war that he seeks his own death by engaging in Russian roulette for money. This is a very popular image, two very popular ways of thinking about vets in the 70s. But as we move forward, as we recognize the issues that some of our veterans are dealing with and we become more sympathetic to the challenges that they face, the image changes as well. So by the 1980s, we're getting a much, much different viewpoint, including my, my wife's favorite show of all time, Magnum P.I. <laughs> right? We got Magnum P.I. Then we got Sonny Crockett from 
Miami Vice. Right? <laughs> These are people who didn't serve, but like volunteered and served multiple tours in Vietnam. And then, of course, the Haiti, which had a slightly more complicated view because you had, uh, I forget the character's name, but the one who was crazy. But by this point, he wasn't crazy in a dangerous way, but he was entertaining in a funny way. Okay? Um, and then on film, um, we focus on more dramatic views, particularly on views in which soldiers are healing, either physically or mentally. Um, the two most well-known from the late 90s are Gronkovic, as you see, uh, played by Tom Cruise here in the movie Born on the 4th of July, and Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump. Oh, boy. Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump. Yes. Okay. Lieutenant Dan very much symbolizes the discussion we've had over two decades and very nicely be summed up in the storyline of Lieutenant Dan. In the 1970s, he is bitter. He is destitute. He's living on Skid Row. He's an alcoholic. And he's in a wheelchair. He's emotionally unstable and all he wants to do is die. <laughs> By the end of the film, he is stable, he is sober, he is rich. Remember how he got rich? Invested in Apple on the ground floor. <laughs> this is the story of America in the 80s. And more importantly, he can walk. He gets out of his wheelchair. It's like Lieutenant Dan is no longer disabled. It's, it's, it's a, America is no longer disabled by the war. The storyline is very much summing up this process that we are going through. So by the mid-90s, we've largely found a way to discuss our veterans, to understand their experience, to understand the issues that they, they uh, were challenged with and faced with when they returned. We found a way of pushing the politics to aside. We found a way to memorialize those who did not return home. Okay. There was still one more part, though. The Vietnamese. Okay. Um, in the 70s days, the Vietnamese were faceless, they were nameless, <coughs> and they were dangerous. What you have there uh, on the top, or are we left, is a scene from, again, The Deer Hunter, where uh, Al Pacino and his comrades are forced to play Russian roulette after being captured by the, the Viet Cong. Uh, in the bottom center, you see the woman who is the assassin in full metal jacket. And then you see uh, the Vietnamese as <coughs> two-dimensional <coughs> suffering villagers in platoon. A film that very important changed the discussion we had about Vietnam. By the turn of the decade, though, or turn of the millennium, we have a much different view. We start to see three-dimensional characters and ones that we can find a connection to. In the top left uh, is uh, Leli Hayslip uh, in the film uh, Between Heaven and Earth. It's her uh, semi-fictionalized story of her journey from Vietnam to America when she marries an American serviceman. It's Tommy Lee Jones there. Um, the remake in 2002 of The Quiet American, in the bottom left corner there, shows us several portraits of sympathetic characters, uh, except that being these characters we can associate with. And then finally, the, the final piece of this uh, is also in 2002, in the film We Were Soldiers. There are portrayals of Vietnamese soldiers, both the officer who leads the Vietnamese forces in the Battle of the Andrean Valley. Um, he is every bit as smart, capable, determined and brave and honorable as his counterpart, counterpart Lieutenant Hal Moore in the film. He is in every way more equal as a military leader in this film. There's also a, uh, another portrait of a common Vietnamese soldier whose diary is captured and then it contains pictures of his wife and child and then eventually gets sent back to his wife and child years later. And then finally, in the bottom right corner, what we see is something that has been happening over the past several decades. Meetings between actual soldiers from both sides. The Vietnam veterans from the United States going to Vietnam and meeting their counterparts. And this is all part of 
the healing process. Which brings us full circle back to Ken Burns. If you're a historian, you can't get away from Ken Burns. He's everywhere. <laughs> he is everywhere. It's like, oh, I like the Civil War. There's Ken Burns. I like baseball. There's Ken Burns. He's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. um, so this documentary, so it's an intriguing documentary, and it's largely a factually accurate examination of the war. But its interpretations are troublesome, and from a historical standpoint, problematic. Because its conclusions are built equally on the facts and the memory of the war that has developed over the several decades that I've just covered. Historians, when this thing came out, complained that they were not involved. In fact, if you watch the film, you're going to see very, very few historians, professional historians in the film. I think there's maybe two that end up on film. And their critique was, well, because we have been excluded, the film lacks this kind of accuracy, historical or factual accuracy, and that the critical assessment is not as correct as it should be. And they are right. They're not incorrect in that. But what I think they miss is the fact that that's not what Burns is trying to do. Okay? He's not trying to create a filmed version of a history textbook about the war. What he has created is the most recent contribution to our discussion on how we should remember the war. And if you look at it that way, it becomes very clear, very obvious, and very obvious that, that is, that's what he's doing. You look at the last episode, 18 hours of this. If you make it through 18 hours, and it's very engaging. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to watch it. But the final episode is called The Weight of Memory. And it's not about the war. It's about the 40 years after the war. And in one recap of the episode, uh, it's described as, quote, Americans and Vietnamese from all sides searching for healing and reconciliation. So now we are all in. The narrative is not, this is what the war did to America, or this is what the Vietnamese did to America, or this is what the Americans did to the Vietnamese. The story is, this is what the war did to all of us. The final spoken words, after all these 18 hours, they, not, they don't come from a historian. They come from Tim O'Brien, who wrote a book, he's written several books about the war. The most famous is called The Things They Carry. I always love signing it to college students because it drives them crazy. <laughs> it's a very complicated book about the war. It does. <laughs> um, so he, he does a reading from the book that's focused on the soldiers, the, the section about what they carry, the things they carry. Um, and once this is over, the credits roll. Okay? And we hear a song. Now, if you've seen Vietnam War films, there are four or five or six songs that always, always show up in these films. Fortunate Son by Creedence Clear Order. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All Along the Watchtower by Jimi Hendrix. Woo -hoo -hoo. Yeah, you know these, right? <laughs> we don't hear any of them. <laughs> What we hear are the Beatles. Let it be. And I was like, I felt like I was getting hit over the head with a hammer by Because <laughs> here's Burns essentially saying, here it is. I have now told you how to think about the war. Let it be. <laughs> Move on. We are now done. Okay. The thing is, if I think we've gotten anything out of this, it's that we're not going to do that. We're going to keep coming back to this. Because the war exists in our memory to help us make decisions about what we're doing today. We still have troops overseas. We still have to make policies about conflict in the world. And we have to include what happened in Vietnam in that discussion. So we're never going to let the war be. Okay? 